Hello everyone, welcome to this short video which is just going to go through CT head interpretation. It's aimed at the level of, of an F1 or an F2, a non-specialist in radiology, just looking at some of the key principles behind interpreting a CT head, and looking at some key pathology to look out for when you're assessing patients and looking at their imaging. The key is to keep it simple. This isn't aimed at radiologists, it's aimed at F1s and F2s. So obviously we need to start with the, the simple stuff. So make sure that you're checking the patient details and also checking the scan details. So is it the right patient? Are we looking at the right scan? And ideally, if you can, it would be good to look at the clinical details as well. That will just help target what you need to look at, i.e. is this a trauma patient? Have they fallen over if they hit their head? Is this a stroke patient? Is this somebody we're worried about? Intracranial pressure, for example. And that will just help you look for some key pathology. Now moving on to look at the different densities that you can see on a CT scan. As the image there shows, black represents air, and at the other end of the spectrum, metal or IV contrasts appear very white or hyperdense. And then everything else is kind of in the middle there. One of the key points to highlight though is that uh, acute blood looks reasonably white, reason reasonably hyperdense, but that changes with time and it does become greyer. So those are the key densities that you're looking out for. Now before we go on to talk about different types of hemorrhage, it might be useful just to refresh a little bit of neuroanatomy. Only a little bit though, because nobody likes neuroanatomy. The picture there shows the meninges. Just very briefly going over those, we have the dura mater, which is the outermost layer. This is a very thick, very tough meninge that is tightly adhered to the skull and the suture lines. Just below that, there's a very small subdural space where you have some veins that perforate through and then below the subdural space is the arachnoid mater which is the middle layer and much thinner than the dura mater. Beneath that is the subarachnoid space and this is key because it contains CSF cerebral spinal fluid which helps us essentially to as a, as a cushion the brain and then finally below that is the extremely thin pia mater which adheres to the, the surface of the brain and the spinal cord itself. But really, the two big questions we need to ask ourselves as a generalist when we're looking at CT scans are, is there any blood and is the middle in the middle? Now, we'll just go on to explore those two questions in a bit more detail. So starting with, is there any blood? As I mentioned before, acute blood is white, it's dense, but it does become darker with time. Now, the image there gives actually a very good example of how the colour of blood can change. So at the bottom of the, of the picture in the the inferior aspect there, we see acute blood, which looks like a white, very light grey. And then as you go up that image, as you go to the superior aspect, we see that the blood becomes darker until close to the top it is essentially black. So now we're just going to look at some examples of pathology. The first example is of an extradural hematoma. Extradural meaning between the dura mater and the skull itself. Now these are normally arterial bleeds, often related to a temporal bone fracture where you can rupture the uh, middle meningeal artery. Now radiologically, this gives you this biconvex shape, sometimes referred to as lentiform. And one of the key differentiators with an extradural hematoma is that it does not cross the suture lines, which is because of the anatomy of the dura that I previously explained. The next example is a subdural hematoma, subdural referring to below the dura mater but above the arachnoid mater in that very thin sub uh, subdural space. Now these are venous bleeds uh, often related to sudden acceleration and deceleration injuries that you might see in a, in a road traffic collision for example. The picture shows more of an acute subdural because the, the blood is much whiter. In clinical practice we need to be suspicious of more of a, of a chronic subdural which may present much more subtly with personality changes, gradual onset confusion, drowsiness, and we should be particularly worried about these in patients who are anticoagulated, which increases their venous bleeding risk, and those with atrophied brains, because essentially there's more space for them to bleed into. Radiologically, subdurals appear as uh, more of a crescent shape, and because they're below the dura, these can cross the suture lines as opposed to the extradural. The next example is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now you see these in high mechanism injuries, giving blood in the subarachnoid space. One of the Analogies I like to use, it looks a bit like a squashed frog, which you might be able to appreciate from the images shown. Now clinically, this is going to give you a severe headache. You can get some meningeal irritation. So a lot of these patients have neck stiffness or certainly report neck stiffness. Uh, the GCS may be reduced. 
and there may be some photophobia as well. And the final example here of, of intracranial hemorrhage is of an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Now these just occur in the brain parenchyma itself, and these have the worst prognosis. There's much less that the neurosurgeons can, can do with these patients. Very little they can actually intervene on, and these are likely to be medically managed with blood pressure control and reversal of anticoagulants. The second big question that we need to ask ourselves is, is the middle in the middle? And by that, we're referring to midline shift. Now, midline shift essentially is where the structures of the brain and the ventricles particularly get pushed to one side. And this pushing effect is from something raising the intracranial pressure. Now, essentially, by the time that you've got midline shift, this is actually a very poor prognostic indicator from a neurosurgical point of view and is suggestive of uh, of a significantly raised intracranial pressure which is why it's important to detect and important to look for. After we've explored those two big questions, i.e. is there any blood and is the middle in the middle, then there's other things we need to look at. And those are, as I mentioned there, the brain quality, the ventricles and the bones. So if we're going to talk about the brain quality, cerebral atrophy is something that we need to look out for. Obviously, this is common in the elderly patients. It's common in patients with dementia. We can see it in patients with alcohol excess. And here there's just general volume loss. The example there also shows quite large ventricles, which we'll come on to talk about a bit later. Sulcal effacement is a, another important sign that we need to look for. The two images there, the image on the left is a, is a normal looking CT scan. As you can kind of see, the sulci are quite crisp. You can see those there, the, the black finger-like projections from the outer aspect of the brain looking quite crisp. Whereas the image on the right, you see that those sulci, those black spaces are lost. And that's a good example of sulcal effacement. Now, sulcal effacement is largely suggestive of raised intracranial pressure. Again, a poor prognostic sign. Another thing we look at in terms of the brain quality is the grey to white matter differentiation. And again, as I hope you can appreciate, the picture on the left, i.e. the normal CT, there's some lighter tissue to the outer aspects of the brain and then some darker tissue around the ventricles, which is looking at the grey and white matter. But on the pathological example on the right, you see that sort of colour differentiation is lost, and everything looks a little bit more uniform in terms of its colour. And this is an example of the loss of grey-white matter differentiation. And this is largely due to edema, uh, most commonly due to hypoxic brain injury, which is the, the example given there. You can see this in patients with infarcts as well, but that generally is more limited to an area, i.e. a vascular territory. Less common causes that you should just be aware of would include a brain tumour and an abscess, but these tend to have a slightly more distinct shape, uh, often as sort of an irregular circle. Now moving on to talk about the ventricles. It's important to check for both size and symmetry when you're looking at the ventricles. In the example here on the right, you have enlarged ventricles, which would be suggestive of hydrocephalus. Whereas if you had one large ventricle and one normal ventricle, that would suggest some sort of obstruction to the CSF flow. And finally, one of the key things that we also need to check are the bones, particularly in the context of trauma. Now, again, you're just checking for a smooth, regular shaped bone around the skull and around the face and looking at the maxilla and around the eyes. Just be aware that sometimes suture lines can mimic fractures. So just to summarise then, as I said, it was a very rapid run through of the CT head interpretation. But I think the key take home messages are uh, don't forget the basics. So make sure it's the right patient and the right scan. Look at the clinical details. and Just use that to target your interpretation. Be systematic, be thorough, be slow, be boring. Looking for symmetry is one of the key things that you can do. And if something is asymmetrical, it will stand out a little bit more. And even if you can't describe that pathology in great detail, It's important that A, you can detect it and B, you can highlight it to somebody who will be better placed to interpret it. And finally, the key take home message for me, if you're an F1 or F2 looking at these CT scans, is is there any blood and is the middle in the middle?